Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here, and today I've got another interesting knife review slash knife overview to share with you guys. This is the CRKT Attaboy with the uh, Deadbolt lock. I wanna apologize right, uh, right off the bat before we get started. I am most likely gonna say deadlock multiple times instead of deadbolt lock uh, in this uh, review, and that's just that's hard to keep that all together. Uh, so uh, it is officially the deadbolt lock, which is actually a, a great locking system, uh, a very strong locking system uh, that's offered exclusively by uh, Columbia River Knife and Tool. So uh, pretty cool. Anyways, thanks so much to CRKT. Uh, for sending this in for me to take a look at. It is absolutely available right now, or at least at the time of this recording. So I will link it right down below for you guys to take a look at. Uh, it does help my channel and use my links, but that's entirely up to you. Thanks so much to my generous patrons for supporting me. Link for Patreon down below, and please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. Let's go ahead and get a measurement of this guy. It's not a huge knife, not uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Overall length of the attaboy. Attaboy, it coming in. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why I did that. Six, uh, six and a half inches overall. Your blade length is coming in at about 2.75. And then your cutting edge is coming in at yeah, shy of two and a half, 2.4. Let's go ahead and do some size comparisons. Just a couple. How about up against, let's go ahead and put, up against, uh, put it up against the Demco AD 20.5. Here it is up against the RAT uh, Model 2. Here it is up against the RAT Model 1. Uh, how about the Spyderco Para 3? There we go. Why is the rat? There we go. Let's do that. And how about the uh, Benchmade Bug Out? I think that's those are probably all good enough. How's the action? Well, it's assisted. A lot of CRKT knives are assisted. So as soon as you go to flip it, um, it's going to deploy pretty much however you do that. Um, people have different thoughts on assisted knives. My my feeling, honestly, is that we don't really need the assisted feature anymore. Um, I think that properly tuned detents and properly tuned systems that allow for knives to deploy without the assistance of some sort of torsion bar or spring are readily uh, readily available. Uh, readily available, and we have you know we got like a million examples. So some people still like them. Uh, if you're new to the knife world. Uh, assisted knives, you know, I remember the first time that I had an assisted knife, it made me feel like I had a switchblade. And back then, you you know, in Kansas, switchblades were not legal. This was pre-2013, 2014. And uh, I was like, yeah, it's kind of like a switchblade. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> um, but it makes you feel cool, right? But um, yeah, if you're new, there are manual knives that deploy just as fast, just as easily. So I'm not the biggest fan of assisted knives. Um, but as far as assisted knives go, this actually is pretty easy to manipulate. The deadbolt lock, if you've never seen it before, you just push down on, literally it's, it's the entire pivot, it sinks down in there and then it'll release it. Tension doesn't start until about 90 degrees and then you can close it. So truthfully, from deployment to releasing the lock and closing it, it's actually pretty effortless. Not really that big of a deal it would be way more satisfying to push this in and then whip it closed, kind of like how you do with a, uh, you know, the axis lock or all the different button locks that are out there. We, we like to push the button and sort of let it drop or just sort of whip it closed. But as far as this setup goes, like it's, you know, if I'm being honest, it, it works just fine. Wow, that was really long-winded. Uh, carry profile up against the Spyderco Para 3. It's a bit thicker, a little bit. This is GRN or glass reinforced nylon. Uh, two different versions of it. It's kind of like we have this overlay here, which isn't really doing anything other than just adding character. And that's okay, because this was, a, a, otherwise it would be very boring. Uh, and it's pretty flat. So that's what's making it a little bit thicker right here. Otherwise, you know, that section of the deadbolt um, would make it a little thicker too. Not really that big of a deal. Truthfully, it's a pretty compact object. Put it up against the PM2 and Para 3. So lengthwise, nowhere near as long as either of them. Height, it's also no, nowhere near as tall, right? Just a teeny tiny bit thicker. What are we looking at for materials? Uh, we are looking at a D2 blade. And then, like I said, we're looking at a, a GRN, so plastic handles. But there is, 
far as I could see, there is a uh, steel line. Yeah, that's the easiest place. So you can see it right there, the lip. There is a recessed steel liner in there, which is great, because otherwise this would feel very cheapy deepy, and I don't like that very much. I'm glad that they went ahead and put that steel in there. It makes it feel way, way more solid. Where is my, sorry, I was stalling for time because I was looking for my scale. There it is. Weight is coming in at kind of a surprising three and a half ounces. Then again, it's still just three and a half ounces, so not the best ratios in the entire world, but still a pretty lightweight and compact object. Most people are not gonna have an issue with that. Let's go ahead and check blade stock thickness real quick here. We are coming in at, I'm gonna guess 115. Probably 120. This thing can be wrong by a bit. 120 to 125 thousandths in the blade sock, which is probably one of the most common, you know, spine thicknesses in the knife world, at least in my experience. Uh, so there you go. Hardware check. Let me get out my tools as per usual. My tools are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them right down in the section of my description that talks about the tools I use on this channel. I think, is that actually a T, is that pivot a T8? Yeah. I've watched Nick's, uh, Nick's, Nick Shabazz's disassembly of deadbolt knives, and I don't think they're super complicated. The pivot is definitely a T8, and that deadbolt is part of the pivot. Then we have a bunch of T6 screws. <laughs> we got a bunch of them holding in this overlay, and then we got a bunch of them that are, that are you know, integrity screws. I think one of these might go through and actually hold, yeah, it looks like it actually holds the, uh, the cartridge liner, or not the cartridge liner, it's just the, it's the uh, recessed liner in place. A lot of screws, uh, so nowhere near minimal hardware. Still though, even though they're T6, I'd rather them not be T6, and there are way too many of them, it's not a deal breaker. Make sure you have a good place to keep your hardware. I like to use a magnet. I've got a magnetic angle square that I, a lot of people ask what this is. It's an angle square, but it's magnetic, and I like to use these little spots to keep the, uh, hardware after I, you know, disassemble it, uh, disassemble a knife. Um, so something like that and quality tools and you should be good to go. Um, okay, have we done everything? I think so. So um, the first thing I wanna point out here is that uh, because of the size of this thing, uh, or I'm sorry, because of the way that the handle is shaped, um, this is, despite it being a smaller knife, it's not a tiny knife, it's just more of a, like a medium sized, like a medium small knife, um, it's actually, wonderfully ergonomic. This is, uh, it reminds me a lot of the CRKT uh, Pilar, Pilar, I am never, um, you know, pronouncing that perfectly, but not the, not the overall design necessarily, just like the, uh, the look of it, right? Um, if you're wondering, can you get in there and get that little, kind of, I would say it's not, uh, definitely not the primary means there. You can also front flip it <laughs> because it's assisted. Um, and then you can you can flip it there from the rear. Um, but yeah, the ergonomic lines are actually really good. If you're choking back, um, you're probably just gonna get maybe three, three and a half fingers. If you're choking up, they're all gonna be there and they're all gonna be comfortable. The pocket clip is nice and short, which was a really good, I love seeing these shorter clips, even when they have a bit of a right um, at the end. There's still, like the comfort on this is spectacular. The one thing though, I'm sure you can guess, the one thing as a right-handed person I am concerned with is the fact that my index finger lands right, almost exactly right on top. Truthfully, choking up, it's landing about here. So I'm not perfectly centered on it, but I'm definitely on it. And if I squeeze, I'm definitely pushing it in. Now, how much force does it take to actually disengage the lock? The top of that actually has to be flush with the outer lip of this before it will disengage. So you are on it. And if I'm being honest, while I'm squeezing this, I am actually pushing the button down and it's getting to where the blade is wiggling a little bit, but it's not actually disengaging the lock. Pushing it all the way down deliberately, I can get it to disengage, but I really have to be very deliberate doing that. That is something to keep in mind though. So keep it in mind. Left-handed folks, I don't think you're really gonna have much of a problem with it. I mean, even with the button being on the meat back here, there's no way you're gonna squeeze that hard enough to disengage it. It is in kind of a weird place though. If you choke up like this, right? If you keep your finger right here, nowhere near the button, then you're gonna be okay. But if you're gonna be doing work with it like this, pushing the edge into some thick material, doing a power cut, I don't, that's the only way I can describe it, 
then yeah, you might actually come down on that button. So keep that in mind. I don't think you'll have an issue, but I want to point it out. Uh, but yeah, ergonomics are great. I always appreciate when I see jimping. There's jimping here and there's also jimping here, meaning if you need to, you can make use of, this is nice because sometimes, sometimes I want to use, an, I, not always, but sometimes I want to hold a knife like this to do delicate, intricate work, right? Uh, it's nice to have a spot to brace my thumb where it's not sliding off the edge, right? If I'm doing, I don't know, surgery on a grape, uh, then it's nice to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, another thing that I appreciate is this uh, tumbled finish. This is really nice. I don't know that I've seen too many tumbled finishes from CRKT, but I like how this looks. It will definitely wear well over time. I mean, you know, use this thing for five years and the blade will probably look about the same uh, for sure. There's a flat that carries out about 75% the length of the blade. Uh, there's a swedge up here, quite a bit of material out to the end. We have more of like a sheep's foot, kind of. I know people always jump on me when I try to say the blade shape. Uh, whatever, whatever you want to call this, right? A pterodactyl Tuesday, whatever you want. Um, but yeah, I like this blade shape where the uh, nose comes down. I like that getting into packages and things and being able to put my finger up here on the nose if I want to do like a draw cut or something. And then there's belly for slicing. As far as the actual edge goes, it's fairly thick for a knife of this size at what I'm guessing is about 120 thousandths. And then, you know, considering it's flat ground from here. Um, how it actually feels on paper, it's okay. It's all right. We're doing a little bit of tearing. We're doing, which it's definitely slicing, right? But we're doing a little bit of tearing, um, a little bit of, you know, it's just, uh, there's lots of, I mean, there's, there's lots of knives that are substantially more expensive that have the same type of edge. For day, for, uh, you know, day-to-day -day EDC stuff, there's nothing wrong with that edge at all. If you're a professional wizard sharpener, um, then uh, you can get it however you want, right? Do, do what you're gonna do. Um, so yeah, uh, this, I, I kind of honestly kind of appreciate since it's, they are doing GRN, which is not my favorite material at this price point. I am always going to prefer aluminum, micarta or G10. Uh, I can't imagine that they're that much more expensive to take and then turn into knife handle materials, but they're a little bit, maybe they're a little bit more expensive. I don't know. I appreciate that we have a different color and a different shape, right? Because this would otherwise be very boring. They've even done a little, you know, texturing on top of this. It kind of reminds me of uh, water droplets on glass. But yeah, it, it's fine. It, it looks it looks good. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it offers meaningful traction or at all, but it looks good. I don't have a problem with it. Backspacer, it's the same material and it's pretty much flush. There's some areas where it's not perfect, but okay. I mean, it's kind of hard to make it look absolutely perfect. It probably should have been this color, right? They probably should have made that blue, uh, but they didn't, so oh well. For some reason, this is not, uh, well, you know, mainly because it's the right-handed, like I guess they intend for the um, button to be a right-handed thing specifically. I don't know why if you're left-handed. Well, I guess it does make it quite a bit, that's quite a bit of a more difficult process, even if you are left-hand dominant. Because um, you want to use your thumb. That's definitely, you know, the way that you want to manipulate that. So I guess it, it, this is basically a right-handed knife. Sorry, lefties. The pocket clip, I, I like it quite a bit. I don't think the swoop needs to be quite so aggressive, but the fact that it's short and rounded off back here makes me happy. Um, it's not uh, being prioritized over the lanyard hole, which is great. I, they probably, you should, probably should have recessed that screw, but not really that big of a deal. It honestly goes in and out of the pocket just fine. If you didn't know, the deadbolt lock is definitely one of the strongest locks on the market. Uh, it is like the triad lock in the center. Right there, I said that, and I can hear the pitchforks coming out. Calm down. Calm down, cold steel crowd, all right? You just settle down for a second. In the same sense that you will likely, in the most extreme of circumstances, likely destroy every other part of this knife before you destroy that lock. Um, it, the way that these are put together, if you've not seen their demonstration on that, the way that they're made, 
Uh, yeah, no way. <laughs> no way. The thing is freaking completely and totally overkill. But that's cool, you know? In the same way that the triad lock is cool. Uh, you'll break every part of those knives before you <laughs> disengage the triad lock. And it'll, you know, in order to do that, it'll take an unnatural amount of human force or, I mean, intentional abuse, right? So it's not even really something we need to worry about. I do like the deadbolt lock. I think it's cool, though. The idea behind it is definitely cool, definitely unique, weird, right? The stop pin is, um, there's actually a, well, the the lock itself, no, wait, I'm sorry. There, yeah, it's a, you can see those two little sheer, like, things right there, which are, I, I believe, actually part of the deadbolt lock. But then there's a closed position stop pin right here. So, there you go, that's how that works. In the uh, open position, if you don't touch the actual lock, let's go ahead and flip it again. In the open position, the lockup is very good. There's a teeny weeny tiny bit of up and down play, but because of how because of how that deadbolt engages, up and down play is a problem. It's a scary problem on a liner lock or a frame lock where the locks are very much dependent on geometry uh, to to keep in place. This lock flat out will not disengage unless you push this button all the way in until the peak of that cap is actually flush with the uh, the outer rim of its whatever you call that. <laughs> I don't know what to what we call this this, this hole, I guess. Um, so yeah, the up and down play is very minimal, and I, I really can't say that it bothers me. It doesn't make me think that the thing's going to disengage. It's incredibly minimal. Pivot lash, there is none. And while there is, you know, tension right here, uh, and it is assisted, it is a, it's a smooth assisted operation. So um, let me say this: this is made in Taiwan, not China. It costs quite a bit more to manufacture things in Taiwan than it does in China. So before you go rip off, rip off, I can get blah. Consider whatever it is that you can get that's the same materials for less, consider first off that it's probably made in China, right? That being said, the price does feel a bit high, but instead of just complaining that it should cost less, I'm gonna offer a different, a different conclusion here. The price on this, as far as both CRKT's website and Blade HQ, which is the two places that I check, it comes in at 100 bucks, which, yeah, right off the bat, it feels pretty high. The deadbolt lock is their own thing, Right, that's cool. It probably costs a little bit more to make something like that than a liner lock, I think it's safe to say, right? There's not anything spectacular going on with the blade. It's made out of D2. There's not anything spectacular going on with the handle, right? Not not anything like that. So, um, instead of, like I said, instead of just being like, it needs to cost less because, well, yeah, we want everything to cost less, right? But that's not the way that the world's working right now. It's not gonna. Um, what I would like to see is not the GRN or the FRN, right? I mean, it's not a, like a, as far as like a weight saving thing or, you know, you're getting great strength to weight ratio. I don't think it's going to be that much different with a G10 or aluminum. I think the aluminum or G10 would just feel better. Uh, there's plenty of, of course, different colors and things like that that you could do, uh, with either. You could do a texture pattern, make it look good, right? Just keep basically keeping it from looking boring but feeling, feeling a little bit higher quality because this, it just feels like plastic, right? The D2, eh, it's kind of hard for people to choke D2 down. Not all D2, CPM D2 is a different thing, but this is Ingot D2, what we see on, mm, if you're QSP, $35 Chinese knife, right? That's why it's hard for people to choke that down at 100 bucks. Uh, it'd be cool to see CRKT using uh, some more 14C28N. People are, like to see that, right? Stuff like Nitro V. There's a handful of others that, you know, 154CM, some steels like that that are a little bit more acceptable at this price point. Now, now you know, to be fair, those steels are going to, it's going to cost CRKT more money to just implement that steel on the snipe. However, right, all of this, there's there's a bunch of different things I could suggest that could make this great, and then then I could see it, and then make it fifty dollars less, right? Let's we they're not genies. We can't just be like can make this make us happy, right? The thing that I want is the deadbolt lock to not be a uh, in combination with the assisted feature. 
I want to be able to push that and like whip it closed and open, right? That just, you know, or to be able to like front flip it and whip, like that would make it super cool. If this, this, this hole was a bit more accessible, giggity, uh, and then being able to like flip it and then whip it closed and then be able to like front flip it, it just would make it, it, it seemed, this knife feels like it's got a lot of potential to like really be something that, you know, knife enthusiast people like, and then also people who take their stuff out and you, because the enthusiast knife community, are, we're, we're usually not purists in the sense that we just like knives and we just like having them. Most of us actually take our knives out and use them, right? <laughs> Despite what the purist user community believes, which is a silly, it sounds like I'm making this up, but you should see my comment section, right? Um, but yeah, no. We uh, do take our knives out and use them, but it's also fun to kind of fidget around with them a little bit. And you know, if CRKT wasn't aware of that, then they wouldn't be making things like the deadbolt lock, which is clearly something that's meant to be both strong and kind of fun to play with, right? Um, so yeah, my ideal version of this knife would be something like G10 or aluminum with a blade steel like 154CM, 14C28N, you know, Nitro V, something like that, and then a manual deadbolt lock that had, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe they need to have it running on bearings to get it, you know, working correctly or whatever. But that would be the ideal version of this. And then, you know, at that point, I would even say you, you might even be able to charge slightly more. I mean, if they did that, like let's say they did 14 C28N or 154, let's say they did 154 CM, made it aluminum and it was manual and they charged a hundred bucks. People would be pretty happy with that, right? Even at a little bit more, I think like 110, 115 or something like that, I think people will be really happy. Now, what I'm suggesting here, as far as what it costs CRK to, CRKT to do that, I don't know. They might, you know, if they were watching this, they might be go, going like, dude, we wouldn't be able to do that for, for any less than, a, than 150, right? Maybe, it just depends on how much it costs for their Taiwanese OEM to take those materials and turn them into a knife. I don't know. It's just kind of hard to justify exactly this at $100. It's a cool knife. It's a little bit quirky, a little bit, you know, a little bit different. It's got great ergonomics. If you pick this up and buy it, will it work well as a day-to-day -day EDC? Yes, it'll work just fine and it's made well. You just really need to watch that button if you're gonna choke up on it. You gotta watch that and make sure you're not squeezing it so hard that you accidentally disengage it because that would not be good. I think you'd have to be pretty deliberate, but it wouldn't be good. As it sits, this isn't like a, you gotta rush out and buy it kind of knife. I'm gonna provide a link down in the description so you can check it out if you want. CRKT has a crap load of really cool knives though, so I suggest that you at least check out the link that says, you know, shop CRKT knives so you can see everything else they've got going on right now. They really do have a lot of, a lot of really cool stuff and a lot of stuff that I think people, you know, new people, you might not realize like, oh, that's a CRKT, I've seen that knife before, right? Yeah. Uh, so check out the other stuff that they've got. This one, eh, it's okay, but not not my favorite thing in the whole world. I think that's gonna be pretty much it today, guys. There's not really a whole lot more that I can say. Thanks again to CRKT for sending this one in for me to take a look at. Please, make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do of course have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching everybody and have a great day.